This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gido Yort. It's Thursday, March 26th. This is Africa 54. Due to the global outbreak of COVID-19, Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees. So our broadcast will look a little different today and in the near future as we, out of an abundance of caution, reduce our staffing at VOA headquarters in Washington. We are working to help keep you informed about what's going on and we appreciate your staying with us on Africa 54. Italy, the United States, and Spain are now among the key centers in the fight against the global coronavirus outbreak, according to the latest statistics on confirmed cases. But Italy and Spain have already reported more deaths, with Spanish health officials saying early Thursday nearly 740 more people have died, bringing its total to more than 3,400. Spain is extending the country's state of emergency and a lockdown requiring businesses to close and people to stay home at least through mid-April. Italy is close to surpassing China in its number of overall cases, and given its soaring case numbers in recent days, the United States will too. The latest John Hopkins University figures put the U.S. at almost 70,000 confirmed cases with more than 1,000 people dead. U.S. doctors and nurses are facing shortages of protective equipment to keep them safe as they care for COVID-19 patients. And late Wednesday night, lawmakers officially passed a $2 trillion stimulus package to give loans to businesses, boost unemployment benefits, and send checks to American families. The measure is expected to pass the House of Representatives Friday for signature by President Donald Trump. Now across Africa, governments are imposing states of emergency in an effort to stop the spread of COVID-19. In Senegal, President Macky Sall has imposed a curfew from 8 p.m. until 6 a.m. and officials are banning public gatherings and limiting transport between regions. In Ivory Coast, the curfew is from 9 p.m. until 5 a.m. and all restaurants are closed and there's a ban on unauthorized travel between the coastal town of Abidjan and the interior. South Africa is reporting the most coronavirus cases in Sub-Saharan Africa, and President Cyril Ramaphosa ordered a 21-day lockdown that began at midnight on Thursday. The Deputy Director of the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Dr. Ahmed Ogwal, said the continent has learned lessons from the Ebola outbreak and is better prepared to respond to the coronavirus. Dr. Agwo recently spoke to VOA's Salem Salomon. Indeed, um, Africa has learned from uh, the Ebola um, outbreak of 2014-2016. And um, that is why when um, this particular outbreak started, uh, Africa CDC uh, is present. This is one lesson learned. During the Ebola outbreak of 2014, there was no Africa CDC. But uh, the heads of state found it uh, wise to be able to establish um, an, a continental uh, specialized agency uh, to address um, uh, this um, emergency preparedness and response. So that is one. Um, secondly is um, a cross-border collaboration. Um, this has been a very big lesson uh, during the Ebola time, and we are using it quite effectively now. Um, uh, during this uh, COVID-19 outbreak so that countries are coming together and utilizing resources in one country to help the other country. And that way, each country does not have to have the full set of resources that are required uh, to be able uh, to address the outbreak, like laboratories, um, experts, um, and um, uh, other experiences that come into play uh, to address the outbreak. Third is that... Um, um, during the Ebola outbreak, the policy side was a bit slow to respond, and we've learned from that. Uh, and and uh, during this outbreak, uh, health ministers um, came together very quickly and provided guidance uh, that we as technical agency are using to be able to build the capacity and support countries on the continent. And finally, um, we also learned during the Ebola outbreak that we needed very close coordination with partners. And uh, during this uh, COVID-19 uh, outbreak, 
we have mobilized partners from the very beginning, and we are working very closely uh, with the various partners uh, on the continent and beyond to ensure that um, we uh, don't have uh, a very large number of cases on the continent. So we've learned a lot from Ebola, and uh, we are using those lessons uh, to improve the way we respond uh, this time around. In an unprecedented video conference of G7 foreign ministers, global leaders are pledging to work together to battle the coronavirus outbreak. The United States says it's ready to work with China to end the global pandemic and restore the world economy. But as VOA State Department correspondent Nick Chen reports, some analysts are skeptical about the ability of both countries to cooperate to fight the global pandemic. Streets and popular landmarks across the world are empty due to restrictions amid the COVID-19 outbreak. Outside China, Italy, the United States and Germany are among the G7 nations that are hardest hit by the deadly virus. In a Wednesday video conference, foreign ministers of the G7 pledged to cooperate to fight the global pandemic with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo noting Washington's willingness to work with Beijing. This is a global pandemic. This is something the United States wants to work with every country, including China, to figure out how to resolve to keep as many people alive, as many people as healthy, and then to restore our economies that have been decimated by the Wuhan virus. As China has worked to tame the spread of coronavirus within its own borders, it has also shipped out medical supplies to countries like Italy, a move seen as trying to supplant the U.S. as the global power. U.S.-China relations were already on a decline long before the pandemic. Analysts say the worldwide crisis has only worsened ties. National University of Singapore's Drew Thompson spoke to VOA via Skype. The threats to embargo the export of medical equipment from China to the U.S., including protective gear, uh, and the war of words between government officials about the national origins of the virus indicates that we probably have not yet found the floor of the bilateral relationship, and tensions are probably going to continue and potentially even get worse. While the G7 foreign ministers did not issue a joint statement, in part due to the reported difference on referring the coronavirus as Wuhan virus, members vowed to act together to pursue a vaccine, bring home citizens stranded abroad, and safeguard the global economy. Nike Chin, VOA News, State Department. Britain's Prince Charles, the heir to the throne, has tested positive for the coronavirus. Buckingham Palace made the announcement Wednesday. This comes amid growing calls among some Britons for the royal family to offer more vocal support in these challenging times for the nation. Henry Ridgewell reports from London. Prince Charles attended an awards ceremony in London two weeks ago. An awkward moment as the future king realized he should not be shaking hands. Despite such precautions, the royal family announced Wednesday that the 71-year-old prince had tested positive for the coronavirus. He is self-isolating in Scotland with his wife Camilla. A spokesperson said he had only mild symptoms and was in otherwise good health. <laughs> prince Charles last met his mother, Queen Elizabeth, on March 9th. It is thought that the cutoff date for contagion has been estimated at the 13th of March. And as far as is known, the Queen is extremely well. Queen Elizabeth issued a statement on the coronavirus epidemic last week, saying that we all have a vitally important part to play as individuals today and in coming days, weeks and months. There have been public calls for her to offer greater support. With Britain in lockdown, possibly for months, the timing is important, says Fitzwilliams. It would certainly be appropriate for the Queen as a symbol of national unity to address a country whose basic freedoms suddenly have vanished with the onset of this terrible virus. And we are just obviously awaiting what the government would consider an appropriate time, I think. 
Prince Charles's diagnosis will raise some concerns over the health of his father, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, since the COVID-19 virus particularly affects older people. With the Queen at 94 in April, the Duke 99 in uh, June, and the two of them together, one of the most remarkable royal partnerships in history. The usual crowds outside Buckingham Palace are absent as Londoners heed calls to stay home and tourists have all but disappeared. Some in Britain say it's time the royal family broke the silence at a time of deep distress for the nation. Henry Ridgewell for VOA News, London. South Korea, which has been among the best in the world at coronavirus testing, has agreed to provide the United States with badly needed test kits. Seoul says U.S. President Donald Trump asked South Korea for the coronavirus help on Tuesday. As VOA's Bill Gallo reports, Trump's request comes at a tense moment in U.S.-South Korea relations. South Korea was among the quickest in the world to set up a system of coronavirus tests, including at these drive through testing centers. Now, South Korea is helping other countries, including the United States, which has struggled to make tests widely available. President Moon Jae-in said South Korea will provide the U.S. as many coronavirus test kits as possible, as long as it has enough to continue testing its own people. It's a role reversal for a 70-year-old alliance. South Korea now helping protect Americans in the U.S. mainland. Been a very busy day. But hours after asking for help, Trump insisted U.S. coronavirus tests are better and were made available faster than South Korean ones. We kept hearing about South Korea. They had a very tough time at the beginning, if you remember. In eight days, we're doing more testing than they've done in eight weeks. The U.S.-South Korea alliance has been strained under Trump. In fact, even as he asks for South Korea's coronavirus help, he's demanding that South Korea pay billions more for the cost of the U.S. military presence here. That fact is not lost on this group of South Koreans who work at U.S. military bases. They are among 4,000 Koreans who will be furloughed next week when money runs out to pay them. The head of the Korean Workers' Labor Union shaved his head in protest. This is how we make a living, so we will continue to protest using whatever means we can. Neither Moon nor Trump has publicly linked the coronavirus issue to the cost-sharing talks. But many in Seoul privately hope the coronavirus cooperation will help the two allies solve thornier issues. Bill Gallo, VOA News, Seoul. Now, schools around the world are jumping into high gear to respond to the COVID-19 crisis. Many classes have moved online as students check in to virtual classrooms. Bronwyn Benito has more. Roshan Jamal is in class right now, in her bedroom. It is very useful for us because we couldn't finish all subjects at school, and now we are completing them with the teachers. Many schools have been able to migrate classes online quickly as schools worldwide close their doors to try to halt the spread of the coronavirus contagion. While more than half of the students around the world are out of school, some can attend remotely where they have adequate technology. Our teachers are coming to the school on a daily basis. They come in one after one or two together, and they're providing their lessons to the students. How do we differentiate between... Roshen says she even prefers some of her online classes to the in-person lectures. With this, I have a recorded video, and if I didn't understand something, then I repeat only that part for myself. Ali says the school wants to accommodate every student, even those who can't view their class live. In case the student was not present, then the lesson that was explained to the students will be uploaded automatically to the student's website. The U.S. is slowly following suit as cases of COVID-19 have increased there. But for parents, there are challenges. So how is it that our young children in Seattle Public School can just run amok because parents have to work, the school is not holding these kids accountable for finishing school. And we're talking about high schoolers, so you can't tell high schoolers what to do. As schools remain closed, teachers and administrators around the world will have to get creative. The adjustment for schools and pupils is easier for some, 
more difficult for others, but a worldwide flu outbreak that has rapidly spread demands isolation, separating students, teachers, and other education professionals from each other. So far, Roshen is embracing it. Bronwyn Benito, VOA News, Washington. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come, in Accra, plus-size ladies can go shopping and look chic. Thanks to one Ghanaian fashion designer, we'll tell you more. Now, as the world battles the coronavirus, shortages of disinfectants are becoming more of a problem. That's prompting some companies like a small distiller in Falls Church, Virginia, to find creative ways to help. VOA's Aslam Tinas has the details. Hand sanitizer is one of the things Americans have been stockpiling most since the coronavirus outbreak. And that's left many store shelves of the product empty. Okay, we ready? To meet the demand, some entrepreneurs are making high alcohol content disinfectants. Falls Church Distillery is one of those businesses. Known for its whiskey production, FC Distillery is busy making hand sanitizers. We've pivoted into making sanitization. It's the same type of process. We're using the same whiskeys um, or base spirits that we would use to make a lot of our other products. But production depends on access to raw materials. Right there back here, uh, we're producing about 300 gallons of sanitizer right now. We could easily do that every day if we could get the supplies. We can only get supplies every couple of three days because there's not as many truckers on the road. Employees say they are happy to shift their business model because it helps the local community and keeps them employed. I mean, it's nice to be able to do something that is helping people. Obviously, it's really hard to find. I went on Amazon just to look at what was available on Amazon, and it looks like people are ripping everyone off. So it's nice to just kind of help the local community and ha still have a job, actually. I feel really lucky right now. So we're just going to mix all these in. Locals say they appreciate the effort. Well, I know he'd probably like to be doing, making something other than hand sanitizer, but, uh, but no, this is a great idea. But, you know, to, to fill a void in the marketplace and to have small businesses set up and, and work together to get this done. It's, it's what needs to be done, and, and it's fantastic. Paluzzi says it is essential to boost people's morale and not to take advantage of their fears by gouging prices. Prices right now is important to us. I mean, that was a very, very important thing to us, uh, to, to not gouge. Right? I mean, because that's what you're seeing now. You're seeing people buy up, whether it's toilet paper or hand sanitizer, and then trying to charge exorbitant, exorbitant prices for that. That's part of what we were battling here, plus the need and plus the reasonableness of fulfilling that need. Stavros says this new approach might last longer than expected. This will keep us busy for a little while, I'm sure, as long as there's a need for the hand sanitizer, uh, more than likely over the next few months, the way it's looking like. Um, we'll be here. Well, I think all of us are trying to do what we can. I think seeing small businesses step up and provide this type of service is fantastic. FC Distillery is currently selling its sanitizers for $29 a gallon, which according to Paluzzi is nearly half of the market price. The company also promises to set aside 5,000 ounces in 5 ounces bottles to give away for free. Özlem Tinas, 
VOA News, Falls Church, Virginia. From alcohol distillers, brewing hand sanitizer to car manufacturers, assembling protective wear, companies around the world have been joining the efforts to combat the spread of the coronavirus. A fashion production house in Italy recently went from fancy pants to fancy masks. VOA's Arash Masadi looks at the absolutely fabulous results. The Moda Impressive factory in Miranda, Italy, usually sews together high fashion fabrics. These days, their operation joins the global effort against the novel coronavirus. Ten days ago, we found ourselves at a crossroads. What to do in the coming weeks? Close shop and have everyone get unemployment benefits or invent something that would allow us to move forward? That's when the idea of face masks came to be. Moda Impressa's CEO, Romola Dorazio, made the switch from fashionable clothes to masks after speaking with a friend who manages a clinic. He showed me the need for face masks. We worked three or four days to create a prototype. He tested it, and last week we updated a new design. Dorazio's friend, Enzo Di Luoso, says the idea came just in time. Last night, the Civil Protection Department didn't have masks to distribute in this region. It's a good thing we created, and Moda Impressa prepared this batch of masks. This situation will go on for several months, and masks are a necessity for the entire industry. Eurasio says he's proud to help the community and happy to have saved jobs in the process. The company now makes three to 400 masks a day. Italy reports at least 74,000 cases of coronavirus and at least 7,500 deaths. Arash Arabasadi, VOA News, Washington. In business, a Ghanaian fashion designer launched her clothing line, Selena Beb, eight years ago. Since then, she has created quite a buzz on the fashion scene in Accra. Now, plus-size women who like to shop but are worried about what to wear and where to buy are getting a custom-made shopping experience right at their doorsteps. Africa 54's Paul Diho has our story. I set out to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I studied law in the UK, but um, I didn't like it. After my degree, I abandoned the law thing and went into the media and did another degree in communication. So I was working in the media um, in Ghana. I moved to Ghana from England in 2008. Yeah, working on radio specifically and doing some radio talk shows and music shows. And when I moved back to Ghana in 2008, I noticed that African print accessories were in vogue. Everyone was using African prints for all sorts of things, you know, um, for bags, for jewelry, not just for clothes. You know, initially or in the past, African prints were just used for clothes. So I thought, wow, that's interesting, especially the bags, it intrigued me because I wasn't used to seeing bags being made with African prints and they were durable as well and stylish and nice. So I started using a lot of those African print bags and people always compliment me and say, they're really nice, can I buy it from you? Do you make them? People actually thought I made them because I was always holding an African print bag. It's like what I'm wearing today is quite plain, but with my <laughs> bold <laughs> and statement accessories. And you make uh, these accessories yourself? Yes. Very yes. good. So, you know, you, you accessorize your clothes and then all of a sudden they become interesting. They go from boring to interesting. How has it been? I started very small. When I started, I couldn't afford to rent a shop. So yeah. I was working on radio, saving money, and then um, buying raw material to produce the bags. And then I used to sell for my car boots. I put the product in my, bag, in my boots. Then after my radio show, I'll go of meet up clients to sell to them. So I started with very small capital and it was more like a hobby. Right. But with time, the business started growing, there was more interest, there was a ready market. And then I expanded and a year later, I rented my first shop. This is where we are right now, is actually my second shop. I just moved here last year. Right. I used to have a smaller shop for um, six years. What has it <laughs> taken to get to this uh, level? A lot of hard work, <laughs> hard work, a uh, lot of try and error, um, risk taking, lots of money as well. Um, it's not been easy, it's been very challenging yeah. because um, finding skillful workers is my biggest challenge to actually produce the kind of quality I want, yes. But um, with perseverance, 
and uh, determination have gotten to where I am now. How, how are customers are responding to some of uh, these incredible designs that I see around here? The response has been good, yes. Um, just like any um, business, there are times or seasons where business is really good and then sometimes it's a bit slow, but most of the time it's good. Um, I used to do just accessories. Like I mentioned, I started with just the bags and then I introduced footwear and jewelry. So for six years, it was just an accessories brand. I was just doing mainly accessories mm. and people loved them. But my customers started asking for clothes because they said, we want your shop to be a one-stop shop where we come and we can find clothes and accessories to go with them. So last year, when I moved into this shop, I decided to add a clothing line. Mm. Um, it's a ready-to-wear clothing line to my range. What has been uh, your single most uh, selling item, for example? It's still the bags. Yeah, people are still not used to selling a bit, making clothes, so they are gradually um, catching on and liking the clothes. But most people come here with the mindset, I'm going for bags and accessories. As we were talking earlier, you talked about uh, uh, you had a personal reason why you went to, into fashion. Yeah. Uh, you wanted something that uh, fits you, you wanted something that looks good on you. That's why you decided to do this kind of fashion level, right? So maybe talk to me about that. My clothing line, the reason I started a clothing line was not just because my customers were asking for it, but uh, I had a challenge as a plus size woman finding clothes in my size. And a lot of people who are my size as well tell me they find it, they find it difficult finding clothes in their size. So that was also another inspiration or reason I started a clothing line. And so because of that, my clothes come up in big sizes as well you know we, we do uk size 8 to um, 22 so women who are on the large size as well can also find clothes from our shop that's inspiring to a lot of women because mm -hmm. i've run into women who are uh, who almost go crazy because they can't find what to wear there are very few shops that cater for them because i i i also get annoyed when I go into a shop and I can't find my size because I feel like women come in all shapes and sizes. Why must it be only for those on the thin side, you know? We the plus size women also deserve to get nice clothes. Not just big sizes, but actually nice stylish clothes because most of the time you find that as a big woman, when you get clothes in your size, they are boring, you know? So I make sure I do interesting clothes for we the plus size women as well so we can also look stylish. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, thanks for watching.